Two teams beautifully poised and in control of their own fates. Melbourne can close out a season of excellence, finishing on top of the table if they're able to beat Geelong. And Port Adelaide could claim themselves a home qualifying final at Adelaide Oval if they're able to finish off against the Bulldogs. So timing is everything, and the timing for these two coaches appears to be coming together neatly. So coaches night, we welcome Simon Goodwin. Simon, great to have you on board. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jared, Jase. So, and uh, Ken Hinckley, welcome back to AFL 360. Thanks, Jared, Jason. Simon, do you, do you await the, the daily update? What, what gets changed in the past 24 hours in this environment at the moment? Oh, in this environment, a lot gets changed in 24 hours and you do wait as a coach for that, for that update because you're keen to plan and you're keen, keen to understand. But in these times, you need to wait, you need to be patient. And, you know, today we found out officially that, you know, the pre-finals buy would be scrapped. So, um, you know, that's a little adjustment that we need to make, but something that we're aware of. But obviously now it's confirmed we can we can get on with it and be prepared for whatever comes our way. And Kenny, what are the ramifications of that buy coming out? Oh, look, not too much. I think, Jared, we've had a, you know, we've had a bit of an idea. I think that it's, it's probably most likely was going to happen and, you know, we just prepare for it to continue on and play each game as it comes and, um, you know, we'll like everyone, we'll be ready to go when the time comes. So, Ken and Goody as well, I'd ask both of you the same question. Given the buy's gone where everyone gets a rest, does that mean you might rest a couple of players this weekend? Uh, probably not, Jason. We're both, um, you, know, you know, in a pretty good position, but we've also got to maximise round 23, and um, we need to uh, obviously play a really high-quality opponent this week in Melbourne and the Bulldogs, and, you know, we need to win that game to uh, qualify as high as we possibly can, so... I don't think there's a thought in our minds that we, we can afford to arrest anyone when, when the quality of the opponent we've got coming up. What about you, Goody? Yeah, look, we're very similar, Josh. We want to create that winning mindset, winning culture and, and continue to build some momentum um, in saying that we're not going to be stupid with our players. Um, we're going to make sure that they're all healthy and, and we manage them in the right way. So if anyone is sore or under an injury club, they just won't play. You know, just like Stephen May did on the weekend. You know, we had that opportunity not to play him. He was a little bit sore, hadn't recovered, and you know, we took that opportunity because of the position that we're in. So does that mean he's good to go now, Stephen May? He's cherry ripe? Yeah, he's good to go. You know, hopefully get three guys back this week. You know, Jack Viney will come back from suspension, Tom McDonald with his back and, and Stephen May. So, um, as I said, we want to continue to build some momentum in our season, and it's a really important time to do that. So the grand final is going to stay September 25. So there are unknowns in here, but there is a week off at some point during that final series. Simon, does the idea, do you half dread the idea of potentially sitting around for two weeks? If things fell your way and you were a qualifying final winner and there was a scenario where you didn't play for two weeks, would that be difficult? Oh, not at all. I think, you know, the AFL are doing the right thing in building some um, opportunities where they can structure the program the way they want it and the fixture the way they want it. Um, and that's what training's for, that's what preparation's for, and um, whatever gets thrown our way, we'll be ready and we'll be able to deal with it. It doesn't concern me too much. Um, we just want the opportunity to play our best footy and be in that, those types of games. So the wear is, is a big issue now for the first week of the finals, Simon. Do you know whether there will be the choice for the team that finishes higher or are we likely to uh, hunt for crowds? I think there's definitely a push for a hunt for crowds. And, you know, watching the game yesterday, Fremantle West Coast, I can understand why. You know, it was an exciting game of footy that uh, that took place over in Perth and you could see the atmosphere of the crowd and what that brought to the game. Um, I think what we do want to do, though, is make sure that no matter where you finish, if you finish in a certain position on the ladder and it's, and it's high enough, you get to choose what you do in your final series. And um, I think that's just still really important to the integrity of the competition to be able to do that. And I'm sure the teams that finish in those positions will be afforded that by the AFL. I'm sure both of you are happy to see crowds back at the footy, but if it became a choice of playing at home in front of no one as to going interstate to play a final at a neutral venue in front of crowds, would you lean one way or the other? Uh, Jason, um, from my point of view, we, we've said this last year and every other time we've been in the finals, I'm happy to be in the finals wherever they need to be. And, you know, if, for the good of the game, the crowd is important. I'm with Goody. I think crowds at the footy are really important, particularly for the finals and the showcase. And we have that opportunity. We'd be, I, I think we'd be foolish, somewhat um, selfish if we didn't perhaps go towards the crowds. And Simon, if you had the choice of an empty MCG or a crowd on neutral territory but what, and you were tapped on the shoulder, which way would you vote? 
Oh, it's, it's a really tough one. You know, we, we love the MCG. Um, we want to really make that our home and, and play there. Um, as I said, as a footy purist, I love crowds. But ultimately, as a coach, you want to coach the team to give yourself the best chance of winning. And the MCG is our home ground. So if at any stage in the final series, if there's a chance to play at the MCG in front of our own supporters, um, we'd take that opportunity. We'd, we'd love to play there. And do you think, Kenny, are we looking at a Perth grand final? If you're forecasting... Um, yeah, I think so, Jared. If, if you were forecasting, I'd imagine that so far, what have we got? We've got um, potentially the possibility of, of three states, maybe as it is now with um, Brisbane ourselves here in Adelaide and, and Perth. Um, Stadium-wise, it's been it's been at the Gabba. You know, we'd we, we'd be pushing hard, obviously, if we could yeah. be at Adelaide because Adelaide Oval's a great place to play, but um, uh, you'd imagine that, that it'd lean towards Perth with the volume of crowd. Goody, we were having a discussion before about whether it's good that the top four teams are playing each other the last week before finals or whether it'd be better just to sort of keep the powder dry and watch them go at it in finals. How much importance do you place on this game or would you prefer, in fact, if, if, if it wasn't a top four matchup? Oh, I'm similar to Kenny in terms of you know, finishing as high as you can on the ladder to give yourself the best opportunity. And I think the opportunity to play yourself against a quality side like Geelong in the last round and obviously Court playing the Bulldogs just gives you a great order of your game heading into finals. Um, you get to have a look at the last little pieces in your game that need to either you need to work on or learn from or improve or you know things that are going really well. So I think it's just a great order as you head into the final series to see where your game's at. And, and Kenny, sometimes people say you hold something back when you're playing the good teams because you know you might be playing them again in a few weeks. Is that actually possible? Uh, no, I don't think so, Jase. <laughs> I think um, it's near impossible. You try and tell a player to hold something back in a game that's as important as we're going to face, both teams are going to face this week against quality opposition. I just don't think it happens. Um, you know, you, you've got to get through the game, you've got to win the game and, and you've got to get through the whole game without injury too. So there's lots of things that go into uh, the game, but more importantly, the result for us and for, for Melbourne obviously is potentially a home final, which is really important. Simon, I know Jace will ask you about the forward structure and the like, but just on your audit through the past few weeks, are you tuning up in the manner that, that you hope to for the run-in? Yeah, look, we are, Joe. We're really stable in the way we want to defend, and, and that's been a hallmark of our game, of what we do without the footy you know, throughout the whole season, and that, that's in really good shape. And the areas that we've been working on you know, in terms of how we move the ball and in and around contest areas and clearance are certainly on the improve. So we feel like we're healthy and in good shape and continuing to find different things that will improve our game. And you know, the players are brought into that. They've welcomed every challenge that come their way, and uh, we just want to continue on with the momentum that we're building. Goody, it looks like Ben Brown's locked down his position. We know a player like Bailey Fritz can have those sort of days, but did you expect Luke Jackson to become a weapon? I mean, he's actually become something now that, that gives you a little bit of X factor. Yeah, look, his development's been extraordinary, Luke. You know, he's uh, clearly a highly talented player, but he's got that ability to impact games, not only with possession, but just with impact around contest areas. And um, he's evolved in the air, he's, he's marking the ball, and... He's, he's providing a great duo with Max in the ruck. You know, it's, uh, depending on what the games need, we can flip him into different positions and um, his game just continues to excel. Is he the rising star, do you think? Oh, I think he'd have to be pretty close. Now, he's uh, had an unbelievable season and you just don't see 19-year-olds the size that he is having the impact that he has in games. It's, it's very rare in our game to see a guy at that age and that size come in and have an impact and he's been able to do that for the whole year. And you've just had Jake Bowie, who's been nominated as the, the penultimate into the group. So he's been a great story right at the end of the season. He has. You know, he's, he's small. He, he executes with the ball really well. He's an exciting player for us. He brings enormous spirit to our group. And I'm just wrapped for the kid. He's worked incredibly hard. And it's, it's really brave of our footy club and our coaches to, to make the move to, to debut a guy three weeks out before finals. But he's, uh, he's certainly uh, holding up his end of the bargain. Interesting incident, Kenny, between Zach Butters and Adam Assad on the weekend. He's ended up with a $4,000 fine. Do you have a chat to him about that? Do you address it? Yeah, 100%, Jase. Um, it's that time of the year where you just don't need to take unnecessary risks. Look, Zach's a you know, really aggressive young player who, who gets after the opposition really aggressively, but there's times and places where you need to make sure it's under control. We had a little chat this evening, to be honest, and um, we, we understand that it's too important to us as a team to have Zach available. We, We've had him out of our team for a large part of this year through injury, which is outside his control. 
These are things inside the control of him, and he needs to make sure that um, you know we, we don't go over the line when we come to playing aggressively. You've got, a, you've got a bloke at the other end of the year, uh, other end of the ground. Is it fair to say Alir Alir could be the recruit of the year? Uh, yeah, he's been remarkable for us. I mean, he's uh, he's been an unbelievable for me. His last two games have been off the charts, to be fair, and um, he's had an outstanding season. He'd uh, you know coming into a new football club, a new state. Lots of different challenges for him, but he's fitted in really well. The boys love already playing with him. Obviously, he's added to our side, so we're excited by him. And if there's been a better recruit this year at a mature age recruit, I'm not <laughs> sure which one it would be. Uh, have you had good news on Scott Lysette by the sound of things, Kenny? Yeah, Scooter looks fine, Jared. at this stage. We've seen him tonight and for the first time. We're optimistic. We took a cautious approach, but he has had a history of, of knees, and particularly for, the, for rucks, it's a really da- dangerous position to play, but we're very hopeful that he'll go through the week uh, and get through to this game OK. How, at this time of year in particular, Kenny, how quick are you on the phone? Tell me tell me what I need to know. Or last <laughs> night, are you ringing out? To, I'd want to know as soon as you know. Yeah, it's exactly right. We do want to be quick at some times. <laughs> oh, look, we've dealt, like everyone, we've dealt with a lot of injuries this year, but, um, you know, we, we, we're really reasonably uh, safe with our medical team that they'll make all the right calls for us and... They'll let us know when they are right and when they're not right. And, um, you know, Scott hopefully will be right this week. So you've had your personnel return, Kenny, and we've all been waiting to see how it would click. Um, It it ends up being sort of a bit gruesome what happens on Saturday from uh, the neutral observer. What do you you get from a game like that where you end up kicking 19 goals in a row? Um, Look, we get a lot of, obviously, a lot of confidence from around the personnel that we've got back in the side, and I think in particular for those three or four high forwards with uh, Gray, Fantasia, Butters all coming back into the side and, uh, you know, hitting the scoreboard as well. Look, you have to do what you have to do. And for us, we were really average and very slow at the start of last week. And then we were able to build some momentum and it was really pleasing to see that. I think we have been building, to be fair. We've been building over the last three or four weeks of those players gradually coming back into the side. We run into this week uh, in, you know, some pretty good form against a really high quality opponent where we'll find out exactly where we're at. Um, when you have your chat to Zach Butters, what do you do? You aim for disapproving parents, or what's your <laughs> what's your tone? We've had sort of state premiers talking to us today as, as disapproving parents. Yeah, no, it's um, it's probably a bit like that, to be fair, particularly with Zach and you know those those three or four young boys that we have in our side. You know, Mitch George is another one of those boys who are they're, they're very young and they're um, they're so full of energy, but. As, as their coach, you sometimes probably act a little bit more like their dad when they, they're not around, but you do your best. But mainly he, he needs to be accountable to his teammates, which is what they'll do. Simon, what do you aim for in those conversations? Oh, similar to Kenny there. A lot of the times you have these conversations, you want to treat them like adults and um, you know, as if you bring up your sons in terms of what, you, what you'd like them to see both off the field but on field most importantly and what you want your team to become and um, those conversations really come from a place of care and, and making sure you can instigate some change so um, you know we have numerous ones throughout the year and you know, normally get a good result. Goody what about the other types of conversations you mentioned you've got three players coming back in you don't want to lose your spot in the Melbourne side right now because that be- could become very very costly it could cost a player a premiership medal it's a great problem to have when you've got to make room but they're not easy conversations to have. No, they're really tough conversations and, um, you know, we've had a lot of guys throughout the year play some really strong footy for us in a lot of variety of different positions and um, it has been competitive for spots and we've been really fortunate to be quite stable with you know, injury lists throughout the year. So those spots are becoming more and more competitive and there's going to be some guys that will have to deal with that and, and continue to invest in the team and find a way to get back in the team. So um, they are conversations that are difficult because everyone wants to win, everyone wants to be part of it. A little more with Simon Goodwin and Ken Hinckley in a moment's time. And then we'll make way for On the Couch, Jared Healy, Jonathan Brown, Gary Lyon and Nick Revolt to assess the events of round 22 and what comes next. The Moment. Brought to you by PointsBet. Well, it's a huge occasion for one of football's modern marvels, David Mundy, who today equals the game's record at the Fremantle Football Club on the biggest occasion in Perth. Well done, David Mundy. I mean, he's not limping to the line either, Hutto. He is in unbelievable form. Here he is, Mundy. Mundy now takes... 
takes his shot, and Muddy in the record equaling game has kicked a goal. If you're David Muddy, you can do anything. The white for the Dockers fans, as Brio's players come from everywhere to celebrate with him in a milestone match. And game number 353, they clean the record today of the club legend in Matthew Pavlich, and he couldn't ask for a better start. He is a modern marvel. He's the poster boy for longevity right now in our game, uh, David Mundy. Uh, we've seen around the world, um, Kenny, Tom Brady's redefined age, Roger Federer's redefined age. Is, are, we, are we in a phase where careers might last longer because of the, the science involved over a longer period of time? Yeah, I think it makes sense, Jared, that that would be the case. I mean, we've got um, Travis at our footy club who's just gone over 300 and looks like nothing like stopping. So I think they look after themselves so well. As you said, we give them great care and we give them great, um, you know, groundings to get themselves in great shape to play football. I think it's it's reasonable to expect that, that this will become a little bit more common with the way players look after themselves today and the support they get, So which is great for the game. It's nothing better than having people like David Mundy and, uh, you know, the great players of the game continue to play for long periods of time. So, Goody, when you're having list management meetings, how much does age play a factor in those discussions, or does it at all? It, it doesn't play into our, into our thinking at all. It's really about how they're playing, how they're going about their footy, the impact that they're having on your footy club. And, um, you know, as Kenny said, there's a lot of players nowadays that are playing a lot of games of footy and um, continue to have huge impact. And, you know, we're seeing it in other codes as well, as you mentioned. And, you know, Cam Smith comes to mind mm. you know, from Melbourne Storm. The ability to have an impact for, on a club for a long period of time um, is exceptional. So we don't take that into calculations, age. We take it on performance and the impact they're having within our footy club. So when we get to these players that are at the back end age-wise but still playing well, what about salary cap management? I mean, their salaries can't keep going up as they get older, can they? Do you get them over the top of the bell curve and start bringing them down the other side? I think it's pretty standard in the industry that that's what happens. And I think the players know that. You know, most of the coaches who have played have gone through that, that eventually your wage starts coming down and... Um, you know, as you get towards the back end of your career, you're certainly invested in the footy club. You want to keep playing, but you also want to see the club thrive and, and see some of the younger players that are playing to a really high level get rewarded as well. So um, there's certainly an awareness in the industry that's take place. Well, that could be an interesting discussion, Kenny, the, when you agree with the player on the moment that you've gone over the top of the bell curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be, Jase. I'm, I'm sure the players would be the first ones to put their hands up too and uh, say, I may have just gone over the edge there a little bit, but uh, take, take a little bit more off me. <laughs> Eddie Betts will have the chance to celebrate him this week. So, Kenny, you've been in the town in Adelaide when he's been such a revered figure and he's provided us all so much so much joy and excitement through the years. What, what, what do you think of when you think of Eddie Betts as a footballer? Oh, look, Jared, I... I know I haven't got much hair, but I reckon he's caused a fair bit of it to fall out, to be honest. Um, having had Eddie in the town for six years playing in showdowns, he is, he's absolutely um, made showdowns at some type stages his own. And, um, you know, the pocket at Adelaide Oval known as Eddie Betts Pocket. Um, he's just been an absolute superstar of the game. I love watching him play. I've said this a number of times. I used to love watching Eddie Betts play, except for when we had to play them, because yeah. he could do unbelievable things. And he's been able to do that right through to this year when he's had some remarkable moments in this year's season. So... He's an absolute champion of the game. I love watching him play. I'm glad he's had great success himself as an individual player. And I wish him all the very best for the future. And, uh, you know, a little chat with him after the game the other night. And it was, it was a nice moment to say, well done. And he let me know at that point that he was uh, going to hang him up. So it was a nice moment to share with him. Simon, do you have an affinity with that? Oh, he's just what a champion. You know, what he's given the game, what he's done is... Um, he's one of the great players that you want to come and watch. And there's probably three players that, you know, get you through the turnstiles and footies, Buddy Franklin, Surioli and, and Eddie Betts. And that's the sort of esteem that you put him in. He's just the champion of the game and he's given the game so much. Great company to be keeping. Uh, Simon and Kenny, thanks for your time tonight. We look forward to talking to you during the final series. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Simon Goodwin and Ken Hinckley with us, Coaches Night on AFL 360. So tomorrow night we will talk to Eddie Betts, Jack Revolt with the Tigers season done and Christian Petrarca as uh, Adam Trelaw, in fact, it'll be, who will be with us as the Dogs look to find their form.